I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Today I began a new series of messages that are going to be taken from at least six or seven verses that are in the second chapter of Philippians. The theme is going to be the mind of Christ. It has been some time since we have developed this subject or have gone through it. And of course, over time, our message increases. The truth of the scripture uh, is greater revealed to us. And so a message like the mind of Christ would take on new and greater proportions. And so I feel a strong leading of the spirit to deal with this subject of the mind of Christ. In Philippians 2 and 5, it simply says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, there are different ways this can be translated. One of the more popular ones is allow the mind of Christ to be in you. Allow the mind of Christ to be in you. Now, that doesn't mean the mind of Jesus of Nazareth. That doesn't even mean the mind of the Lord of glory. What that means is that the mind that is in Jesus of Nazareth and in the Lord of glory should be in your mind. So the mind that we are dealing with here is our mind as it is tuned to or atoned to the mind of Christ. So what was in the mind of Christ is what must be in us. This is the ultimate of spiritual growth. This is the ultimate of growing up in Christ, allowing his mind to be our mind. And we must begin with the bold statement that the Christ in us has no mind but our mind. He has no way to think out of us except through us. Since he has no mind but our mind, then it is important that we hear Paul's message on the mind because the apostle Paul is the only one who had this message on the mind. And remember, not only is our mind necessary to Christ, for if he doesn't have our mind, the Christ in us is mindless. But at the same time, the Christ in us is handless. He's earless. He's tongueless. He's eyeless. For he has no eyes, no ears, no hands, no feet but mine. The only way Christ can operate as me is by me. And so he has no mind but my mind. The Apostle Paul is the one who made this great discovery. There is no doubt about it that no one else in the Scripture saw the importance of the mind like the Apostle Paul did. I have often said that Paul's the greatest psychologist that ever lived because he's the only godly person written in the Bible who knew what made a human being tick. That's what psychology is all about. What makes us tick? What makes us to be who we are? Paul knew it, and he settled on these facts, that if Christ was our salvation, if Christ was our Savior, and he was joined to us in spirit, for he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, if that's so, if Christ is our spirit, then that's a perfect work done by God. That's something that God has accomplished on the basis of the finished work of Christ. But none of that touches the mind. Because when you get saved, mind is not saved. We'll see this in a moment. And so Paul concentrated his whole message on the mind. Of course, the in Christ statement had to do with spirit. But the actual truth of his teaching, the deepest truth is God's done his part. All you have to do is believe what God did is perfect. It's based on the finished work of Christ. No more can be done. These are facts. But he said for the Christian to grow and for the Christian to become what God's intention for him is, he must have a renewal in the mind. The mind must be touched in the earthly journey. It must be touched in the day-by-day -day living. And so the Apostle Paul is the one who directs us to the mind. He makes innumerable statements concerning the mind. As I've often said, you can't read 10, 12 or so verses in any of Paul's epistles that you don't come across a mind term, a mind term like knowledge, wisdom, revelation, understanding. These are mind terms. He knew that that's where the Christian successful living was to be found. He had perfect life in him, 
but how to get that life out and through him. He had a perfect life in him, but how the human being was to take hold of that life and profit by that life and live that life was the key to Christianity. And Paul is the only one in this book that knew that. Not even Jesus of Nazareth could teach that because the in Christ message was not ready to be revealed when Jesus was on this earth. But that message of Christ in you was revealed by Christ himself, the Lord of glory, to the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul is the first one in the scriptures to give us the uh, great truth concerning the tripartite being. And this takes us back to our original three circles. Man is tripartite. He's body, soul, and spirit. When you came into the world, you were created in the image and likeness of God. This is why we use circles, because we put God in a circle. A circle is a line without end, denoting eternality. All the sciences that have to do with life usually use a circle or part of a circle in their diagram. You'll see this, even the abortion people use part of a circle in their logo. And so it is with most of the sciences that have to do with life. That's a theological thing. They took that from theology because God is the line without an end. It is eternal. And so we were created in the image and likeness of God, and that's why we use circles to denote that as the tripartite being. But even though we were created in the image and likeness of God, when we came into the world, we came into the world heavily burdened with the events that had taken place before we were born. Going all the way back to Adam, the Apostle Paul says that whereby as by one man, Adam, sin entered the world, so death and sin passed upon all men. Now that's the justice of God. He had created the human father, Adam. And in this human father, he had given certain responsibilities and he failed. He disobeyed God, and that disobedience was sin, and so sin came into the nature of Adam. Therefore, God said that everyone that is spawned off of or birthed into the human race is going to carry that same stigma of sin. We call it a sin nature or a Satan nature. So when every one of us came into the world, we came into the world with a nature that was contrary to our creation. That's why we always make Satan a square head and put him in a square instead of a circle. We do that because that shows that he is contrary to our creation. So when you came into the world, there was something in you contrary to your creation which would always be a burden and a heartache to you until it was taken care of. Now, it was God's intention that that be so. God did not create us without a sin nature. He could have done it, but that would have been contrary to what happened to human beings. Why is it God allowed little babies to come into the world with a sin nature? Well, the answer is simple. It is only through our nature that we make final and good decisions, and it is because of a thing being in us that is adverse to our creation that we are able to fall in love with God. So let's look at it like this. You have a sin nature. The sin nature is constantly reaching for a mind. It is in your mind that you give direction through your body in expression. Out here on the other end of the human being, because of a sin nature motivating the mind and expressing it through the body, we have a thing we call identity. Identity. Well, this is how we formed our identity. We formed our identity by something in us that was contrary to us. That's how we grew up. That's how we've always lived. We've had a contrary thing working in us. Well, what that did to our identity, identity, I got that spelled right? 
ID. Identify ID. ID in identity. Thank you. Finally, because we had something in us that was contrary to our creation, we formed an identity, but it was a false identity. It was false. It wasn't the real us. It wasn't the real us. Now, you've got to see that because that's the important thing that has to do with the mind. We believed that what we did was the real us. We believed that what happened to us was the way it had to be because that's the way we were. All our life, we believed actually a lie about ourselves. Well, that's, that fits because this Satan nature is put into us by what John calls a liar. A liar and the father of lies. The father of lies. Two or three times the Apostle Paul refers to the fact that the sin nature that's in the human being is in the human being because it was birthed there. We became a child of disobedience, a child of the devil, the scripture says. So you can't be a child unless you're birthed. So the liar worked through us. How did he work through us? He worked through us, through our minds, convincing us that we were somebody other than who we were. Well, this goes on in the human being for quite a time. But in the process of life, God allows the circumstances and the situations of life to mount in a human being until they see there's something wrong, that life is not right, that it doesn't really all fit together. This is why people commit suicide. This is why uh, somebody that may be the most famous and richest person on earth will take their life. Why is it? Because they see that their life is not real. This is not, this is not what it ought to be. They have lived under the liar's influence so long, and they know that doesn't fit. So after a period of time, a person comes to a knowledge. If they've heard the gospel, that knowledge they receive becomes conviction. That's why we must preach the gospel. We preach the gospel that men in their minds might become convicted over the way they're living and over what's happened to them in life. So we, we must preach the gospel. That's why the gospel you preach is so important. If we don't preach the true gospel, then men are never going to have a change in their thinking about themselves. But after a period of time, we were convicted. Where were we convicted? In our mind. Where does the Holy Spirit work? The Holy Spirit works in the mind, in the soul mind. And so after a period of time, we saw that we needed help, desperately needed help. We had become bad sinners, good sinners, good sinful church members. We had become alcoholics, drug addicts, uh, uh, all sorts of different kind of people. We had become something that was contrary to what we wanted to be. That was conviction. And when that conviction took place, then we had the opportunity that God intended all to have. What was that opportunity? The opportunity to have a change in our spirit. A remarkable change in our spirit. So what happened? The gospel was simple. Believe on the Lord. Believe. Where you do that? In the mind. The help of the Holy Spirit. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So every person who came to Jesus inviting him to come in had come to a point where they saw they could not save themselves. They were tired of a false identity. They were tired of the life they lived. They couldn't save themselves. They needed a Savior. And when they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the most remarkable thing that ever happens to a human being took place. There was a rebirthing. Now, this was a sin nature put there by Father Satan. The only way that nature can be changed is by a new birth. This is why Jesus said to Nicodemus, who was the most religious person in Judaism, head of it, if that could be such, he was the head of Judaism. And Jesus said to him, you must, M-U-S-T, you must be born again. So when you come to the point of conviction, you're born again, and Christ becomes your life. 
the God nature is now in you in the person of Christ. Well, you can see right off, no longer is there to be a liar. You've got another circle inside your spirit circle that's compatible to you. Satan is out, Christ is in, and now he's compatible. For the first time in your life, you have the opportunity of being who God created you to be. For the first time. That's what salvation should be. Well, you can see right off it wasn't like that. And as I've always said, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 is the hardest scripture in the Bible to have happened to you. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. For most people, that didn't happen. But on the basis of the Christ life teaching, when God put Christ in you, and he was in you, and you were in him, for by one spirit are we all baptized into Christ, and then Paul teaches that Christ is revealed in us because we're an intimate part of his body. When Christ was in you, for the first time you could become who you were created to be. You see, now we got all the circles right. Ah, but it didn't work out like that because we had a number of enemies. First, we had the enemy over here of the liar who had had such an influence in our life, he now had a big influence in our body and soul, leftover influence, still there. More so in our spirit because we didn't get a true gospel. Thank God we could be saved without a true gospel. Do you understand that now? You got saved because you had a need and God met your need. He didn't meet your need because you're smart, because you had the right gospel, because you went to the right church, or because you believed right. He met your need. It was a personal thing between you and him and had nothing to do with the corporate aspect of religion. So when you got saved, it was between you and God. You may have gotten saved in a Catholic church or, or uh, even some weird religion or some uh, Christian church, so-called, that, that didn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ or something. You could have gotten saved in a honky-tonk. You could have gotten saved in a beer joint. You could have gotten saved anywhere because salvation is not a relationship with religion. It's a relationship with God the Father who gave his Son to be your life. So what happened to us usually was when we got saved, we got involved in religion. We got involved in religion. So we had a lot of things that kept us from being what we were supposed to be. A number of things happened to keep us from being. So what we have here, we have a person who has Christ in them, and that work is perfect, but it never kind of works out on this other end. There's still the problem of a false identity. Let's talk about Christ in you for a moment and salvation. Paul talks about the tripartite man in 1 Thessalonians. And then in 1 Corinthians, he talks about our deliverance. He says that you are, look at the verbs here, you are delivered. Where? In spirit. You are being delivered in soul. You will be delivered in body. The tripartite man, therefore, is perfect in spirit. The moment you accept Jesus as your Savior, you are perfect. That's perfect. You need to see that. You're perfect in spirit the moment you accept Christ. You're saved. Saved in spirit. You are being saved in soul mind. You will be saved in body. Now, nobody likes to use those words perfect. I just noticed in my Bible this morning how Paul used it at least three times. He said the believer was perfect. Where is he perfect? In spirit. Well, do you know the new Bibles won't say that? They say he's perfecting or they tip a tap dance on it and put two or three words in there that uh, try to get away from the idea that we're perfect. See, religion doesn't want you perfect. You understand religion? 
That's why these new Bibles that come out say you're not perfect. Where are you perfect? You're perfect in spirit. Why are you perfect in spirit? Because you're not saved because you're good or bad or going to be good or bad. You're saved by the cross. Salvation is based on the finished work of Christ. It is not based on you. It's based on Christ. And when you said, Lord, I believe, God made it work. God did the work. And he made it work. Why? On the finished work of the cross. So when you were saved, it was perfect. It was perfect. That's why I could say to uh, the big group, we had a huge group at this funeral last week I preached of this man who committed suicide. He had been born again, got into desperate circumstances and took his life. But you know why he went to be with the Lord? Because his spirit was perfect. Why was it perfect? Because he was a good man? Nope, had nothing to do with it. Because he was a man that committed suicide, he had no right to it, that had nothing to do with it. Why was he saved? Because of this cross. He was saved because God paid the price for sin at the cross. Now, this bothers people when you talk like this, so let's just go a step further. If you're going to be bothered, I want to give you a good reason for it. The issue of sin is no longer an issue with God. There is no sin issue with God. No person will go to hell because of their sin. Now, you have that fixed in your mind? No person goes to hell because of their sin. Why do they go to hell? Scripture tells us they haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> what is they haven't done? They haven't taken hold of the cross. They haven't taken hold of the cross. This is why I don't teach that sinners repent because repentance of sin is not the big thing. Now, there are a couple of verses that says believe and repent. All the rest of them, scores of others just say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't make a big issue of that other than to say repentance is not what sinners need to do, not repentance of their sin. What they need to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to learn Christ. They need to know Christ. You see, religion wants to get them all dressed up so they can say, this is one of ours, a trophy. They're good Baptists. They're good Methodists. They're good Pentecostal. They're good this or that. But God's plan is that now that men are saved, born again, it's attributable to the cross. And so God said, the moment they believed, I put life in them. How can you do that, God? They're no count, no good. I didn't do it because of them. I did it because of the cross. Now, see why we make Paul so predominant in this gospel? He is the only one who preached the cross in the Bible. Now, you can make crosses out of everything from the tabernacle in the Old Testament all the way through, but Paul is the only one who preached the cross as the place where God had the right to exchange the nature in the human being. So you're perfect in spirit. You're being made perfect in soul. You will be perfect in body on the resurrection morning when this body puts on incorruption. Well, now what has happened to this human being is that he has Christ in him, but he has the same old mind. No change in his thinking. You ever notice that? No change in his thinking. This is why when somebody gets saved, and I've had it to happen dozens of times, when somebody got saved, uh, the next morning when they woke up, they didn't have the same feeling at all. The night before they were crying, everybody's hugging their neck, everything looked rosy. They woke up the next morning, and what was it? They had the same old thoughts on their mind they had before. So what does religion do? Oh, religion says they got to get in here in the church and they got to get to work and then all that will be taken care of. That's okay. It's good to do something at that juncture. But what really happened was they needed to be told there is no change in your mind. There won't be a change in your thinking except in the process of time and the process of learning. It's a good thing to tell them to get into the scriptures but it's more important to tell them what scriptures to get into because they are desperate to change this old mind. There is no change in the mind when you're born again. That comes through growth. In fact, that's where the love affair is. The love affair is in the mind. Why? Love is a choice. 
unless the true gospel is preached, people will never make that choice. They will do what they do on the basis of works. But you think about it for a moment. When most of us got saved, we were told to get to work for God, and that would, in time, bring us in to what it was we needed to be. But do you know what? Works are a substitute for love. Oh, we did what we did because we loved God, but we made the works predominant because if we didn't do the works, then we weren't loving God. What is a change of mind? That's the acute work of love. Love. Love is a choice. You understand that? Love is a choice. If you love God, it's a choice you make. Why do Christians do bad things? It's a lack of love. Why is it we commit the sin, the sin which is if you know to do right and do it and not, to you it is sin. Why do we commit the sin that violates our knowledge? It's a lack of love. I've thought about it a lot of times when I fail God. I thought here I am in the midst of, of, of something that I ought not to be in. I'm doing something I ought not to do. And the thought would come to me, you don't love him enough, do you? And that's it. I didn't love him enough. It's, it's a love responsibility. Where does that love take place? That's a mind thing. You make your mind up in a marriage. At some juncture in the marriage, one or both of the partners are going to have to make their mind up, this is it. Because the puppy love is gone. The honeymoon love is gone. And at a certain juncture, love is a choice. I choose to love this woman. Now, that choice and that love depends on how stable I am. Can I trust myself? Do I have the guts to follow through, uh, even if she threw the fine plan at me? Do I still love her? Yep, love is a choice. That's the way it's got to be with God. You gotta love him. What's that love based on? If you are a human being with any character and, and uh, degree of depth in you at all, you'll realize that that love is based on the fact that Jesus came to live in you when you knew nothing or little nothing about him when you were still dirty and unclean with an old soul, mind, and an old body of sin, he still came to live in you. That was a love act. So I hear people who do desperate things. I mean, they do real bad things. And they say to me, well, I'm sure glad God still loves me, and I still love God. It used to bother me when people say things like that because I said, well, your actions betray you. But I realized that that love was a decision they made in their mind. If you make that decision and stand by it and live it, then that's what you are. That's who you are. If you don't, then you're back to false identity. Well, with Christ in you, you're still going to have problems in your mind and in your body. Since neither one of these were saved as the Spirit was, Christ is going to be, as it were, vying for your mind. He doesn't fight for the mind. He vies for it. Jesus can only operate through a compatible mind. If your mind is compatible to Christ, then he operates through you, and in time, you get a true identity. That's where the true identity comes in. It comes in with time because he's gotten control of your mind. But something I've got to tell you about the Christ that is in you, the Christ that is in you never fights for the mind. He won't fight for a mind. This is why Christian people very often don't appear to be Christians. They have no control, you see. Uh, I've seen people who had a sin nature in them who had better control than Christians did. It was a mind thing. In fact, I've seen a lot of sinners that lived better than Christians. 
as far as outward expression was concerned. Of course, that has nothing to do with God because he didn't save them because we are going to be good. He saved us because of what Jesus did of the cross. But whenever Christ is able to move through you, then you come to a true identity of who you are, the real identity of who you are. Well, this means when you got saved, there was a thing called soul and body, has a word for it, it's the human self. That's the self, that's the container. At least seven times in the scriptures, we have presented that uh, the human being is but a container for spirit. So our container is this self. Well, I want you to see this because this is the reason why I really got into this series of teaching. The old nature is gone. Christ is out. The motivational fact of sin came from the sin nature that occupied the soul and the body. But that sin nature is now gone, but it's left behind certain knowings and feelings that are still in the human. They're still there. They're not spirit things. They're body and soul things. Uh, let's talk about soul for a moment so you'll know the use of soul. The New Testament does not use the word soul. It's an Old Testament word. Now, it is mentioned a few times, I think less than 20 times in the New Testament, but it is mentioned over 600 times in the Old Testament. What is that? It's an Old Testament term because there salvation was not Christ joined to our spirit. Salvation was the saving of a soul. You'll note how that's still in our vocabulary today. Get a soul saved, or this preacher's a soul winning preacher, or this church is a soul winning church, or our theme is always go out and win souls. That's Old Testament. In the New Testament, we were joined to the Lord. We were rebirthed. What's the difference? In soul salvation, you only have a mind change. You don't have a spirit change. And in soul salvation, everything depends on your expression. Now, that's the kind of churches we grew up in that didn't have the full gospel. They put all the emphasis on expression. If this is where you're saved, then you got to show it. If you got it, you live it. If you, if you have it, you'll show it. Well, that's not, that's not based on Calvary. That's based on us. So in the Old Testament, for 4,300 years of the Old Testament, salvation was a soul thing based on the soul. And so what you did, you did what God said to do, but if you didn't do what God said to do, you weren't where you ought to be. You weren't saved. So it was a coming and going thing, which it is with a lot in religion today. Saved one day and lost the next. Because soul salvation is not what we teach in grace. We teach Christ in us, the hope of glory. So when you got saved, there was no change in soul and body. Body won't be changed till the resurrection morning. But you still, as a Christian, had all these things left over in yourself because you thought that was your real self. You thought that was your true identity. You kept on doing these things and struggling with them. All your life as a Christian, you struggle with the issue I call correction. What are you trying to do? You're trying to correct something. Something's wrong with me. I need to correct it. And that's not really what grace is all about. Grace is not us correcting ourselves. Grace is allowing Christ to begin to live through us. But once again, if you don't preach that gospel, believers are not going to know how to do it. And so to be right in the rest of the world, they're going to try to dress up and fix themselves outwardly so they look like a Christian and talk like a Christian and go to Christian places and do Christian things. But they're still not the change that should be. So they don't understand that when you get saved, you got uh, powers left in the mind and the body that are going to be motivational powers. They're going to be the things you do. Now, this Christ in you will not fight for your soul and body. And so there's a barrier between soul and spirit here and we see Jesus in a different light. Here Christ is a lamb. And a lamb doesn't fight for its position. So Jesus will never overcome the soul mind. You know why I know that? 
you can sit in a Christian church for 50 years and never know Christ is in you. And he is. They got saved. They're born again. But they don't know it. Why is it they don't know it? Christ doesn't fight for his position. Why? He's a lamb. Why doesn't he fight? He doesn't fight. Where's my word? I don't have it here anymore. He doesn't fight because it's a love affair. It's a love affair. If you don't love him enough to search after him and to seek after him and to come to know him, he's not going to fight for the position. Now, I'll tell you what the Holy Spirit's going to do. He's going to give you all kinds of circumstances and situations where it would have been a whole lot better you fall in love with Jesus and do what you know to do than it is to go through all your circumstances and situations. So what's happened to most Christians is we are more attuned to how to correct our circumstances and situations than we are to fall in love with Christ in us. We just don't know much about that intimate love affair between me and Jesus, Jesus and me. Well, you got all these things left over. What are these leftover things in your body and soul? I call it a haunted house. I don't even have room to write on this. I want you to see that. You got to see that. The house is haunted. Haunted house, haunted body. It's got a lot of spooks in it. The past operator is gone. The past governor I like to put it like that. The past governor, who was Satan, is gone. Now the new governor is Christ, and he's sitting up here at the seat of government in the mine trying to operate. But you still got all the leftover mistakes and errors of the past governor. See? You, you change governors, but your old uh, group of people that run the government so fouled it up, so messed it up, that that mess is still there and the new governor's got to contend with it. So Christ the life is going to contend with the spirit. He's going to contend with all of these things that are still there. Those things that are still there are like a haunted house. They're really not real, but they are real. It's really not the devil anymore. It's not the devil in you. He's gone. But he's left behind his footprints. How does Paul handle that? He says, the sin that dwells in the body. Or the, Peter says, the corruptible body. Or the body of sin, the scripture says. Still there. Doesn't mean it's a sinning body. Doesn't have to. But it's still got all of these footprints, these signs, these feelings, these attitudes. I call it spooks in the house. Still there. And when you give vent to those things, you say, well, that's the real me. No, that's not the real you. That's the old you. That's the old man who was crucified with Christ. This new human self is occupied by a new governor, a new ruler, lives in him. So these things are gone, but the feelings are still left there. And, and the longer you live, if you're not careful, the more buildup there's going to be of the problems that are in your human self. You understand that? I mean, the longer you live, the more problems you're going to have. When I was a kid, nine, ten years of age, in the neighborhood I lived in, about five blocks from my house was an old house that had burned down, an old two-story house set way back off the road. And this old house had become the consternation of every kid in the neighborhood because we were for sure that house was haunted. It had sat there 20 years, nobody had done anything about it. And so little by little stories had built up with every generation of kids that had come along. There had been a story. One kid was walking by it one day and he said there were white things flying inside. I could see them. Another kid said me and my daddy passed by there and we heard voices in there. And another kid got it started that if you go up in that house, something will kill you. It wasn't long until that haunted house became the, not only the talk of the neighborhood, but the fear of the neighborhood. Now, of course, there wasn't anything to any of that. 
it was all coming out of the mind of people. It was all coming from the mind. No real spooks. And that's the way your body was when Christ came in. You had all of these spooks in there. The old governor was gone. The cross had taken care of him. Why didn't God give you a brand new soul and body when you got saved? Well, he did. Theoretically, he did. You get the new body on the resurrection morning. Now your mind can be changed and renewed daily. But why didn't he just give you a miraculous change like he did in spirit? Once again, we're back to the subject of love. If he had done that, you wouldn't love him. Human beings wouldn't love God if God took away all their troubles. Do you know that? You know, you think about, you think, some people think, well, if I had plenty of money, I wouldn't have any troubles. <laughs> That's a very carnal thought. Do you know what this is? I read this last week somewhere. Where did I read it? don't remember. But I read somewhere last week that 90% of the people who have won lotteries have ended up in bankruptcy and in far worse dilemmas than that. 90% of them. Now, I hope that's true. I'm passing it on. What is it? You don't solve your problems like that. It doesn't work like that. So you've got a soul and a body. It's got these spooks in it. What do you do? You get some sense. Now, some of you are young. If, if us kids had been told, and we were told, parents and us, that that house isn't haunted, quit thinking that. We'd go down the street and we'd make a circle around it. We wouldn't even get near it, you know. We, and, if, and if somebody was to go into the house, a teenager or somebody, boy, he's bold. He's really somebody. He came out alive. That's the way we talk. Where do you change? You change in the mind. Somebody comes and tells you that by Christ in you, you can rule over these spooks. You can rule over these body pulls. You see, when Satan operated in you, he trained your body a certain way that you can't get over those pulls. See? What made these kids in these school, uh, these school, school killings do what they do? It's because they got their bodies trained with these ideas of the mind so that they could pick up a gun and just fire it without even thinking about what was going on. That must be. They must not be thinking of what harm they're doing. There's, they, they have a mind that is so set against uh, logic and true reason that their body is trained to it. Like uh, if you went to one of these places of, uh, where they're correcting people from smoking, uh, I don't know what they do now. They may have something else. But there was a time when you went there, one of the first things they did was put an electrical impulse somewhere in your body that the, that the thing you always did, reaching for a cigarette, would trigger a small shock to you. And uh, they had it for men that reached up here and women that reached in the purse. One, one company had a bell that would tinkle when she reached for her purse to get a cigarette. They're trying to break the body pull because that's really what it was. The body had been so trained by this, by this false power working in them that they had to break it. So they broke, the attempt to break the body pull on it. I talked to a man in California the other day uh, who is in AA. He, he has this testimony, I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink in 30 years. But he had heard what I had to say on this subject. And he said, you know, that's a truth. He said, I haven't had a drink in 30 years. But he said, if I pass a beer joint or a liquor store, I have a certain pull in my body toward that. What is that? That's the spooks out of the old life. That's the sin that dwells in the body that we rule over by Christ the crucified in our life. 
you rule over the haunted house. Sure, you're going to have it. Sure, Christian is not perfect. You see, the world... You see, the world has never had this gospel. So the world thinks, well, all Christians ought to do perfect things. They ought to do right things. And when they see a Christian go wrong, they don't say that Christian's wrong. They say Christianity's wrong. See? So, so the facts are they had never heard the gospel. The world hasn't heard the gospel. I believe if the world heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified and Paul's message, the world would open up to it. But instead, they got it fixed that everybody that's a Christian is a do-gooder, and if they are not a do-gooder, there's something wrong with Christianity. That's not it at all. That isn't what Christianity, but that's what religion keeps teaching, and I've got to put it in. Religion keeps teaching this doer religion because it couldn't operate without you being the doer. Doer religion is the oil that oils the wheels of man-made religion. So they'd be out of a job. Now, getting back to this person here just a moment. The mind is the seat of government. You're either getting wisdom from Christ in you, or you're allowing the outside world to rule you. Look at it like this. Let's put an ear on this fella. That's an ear. E-A-R. The ear. What comes in through the ear gate is third dimensional. What comes from Christ within is fourth dimensional. Now the mind is the control center. 1 Corinthians 1 and 30. That's the powerful scripture. That tells us really about Christ in us. That scripture says that Christ, this Christ in you, has been made unto you wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Let's just take one of those, wisdom. Christ has been made wisdom unto you. Wisdom. What is he doing? He that is in you is constantly sending wisdom up to you. But if you got a polluted mind, it won't matter. Your mind can be polluted with religion, it can be polluted with stuff in the third dimension. A polluted mind will keep Christ's wisdom from operating. And while I don't have time to go into it, at other times I have told you that the wisdom of Christ is probably the first thought you get every time you have a crisis. You remember we talked about first thoughts. Maybe not perfect on every occasion, but most occasions for a born-again Christian, your first thought was your best thought because by the time you get through mulling it over and talking it over with everybody else, you got more confusion working. Then Christ can't operate. But if you'd have taken that first thought, you'd been better off. And here's the reason I know it. Most people will say when they've had a crisis, if I had done what I first thought. If I hadn't taken more time and had done what I should have done in the beginning, if I had listened to my own heart, I wouldn't be in this mess. That's pretty good, isn't it? What is that for the Christian? That's first thought. That's Christ's wisdom. Christ's wisdom has come. Well, he goes in through the ear gate. Third, third dimensional stuff goes in through the ear gate. There are two kinds of information you get in from third dimension. You get things that matter and you get things that don't matter. What are the things that don't matter in third dimension? Well, that's driving your automobile, taking care of your house, going on your job. You can learn all you want to. You can participate in them. Uh, third dimensional stuff won't affect you spiritually, except you ought to always remember it's Christ as me doing these things that I don't do anything of myself. It's always Christ as me doing these things. Third dimensional things, though, won't hurt you. I used to always say that I had rather watch uh, Roy Rogers on television than a television preacher. 
You know why? Because Roy Rogers stuff was third dimensional. You know, he'd shoot up a bunch of guys and fight them and end up kissing the horse or the woman, and I could throw it out. It didn't mean a thing. But the television preacher commingled. He mixed truth with a lie. He messed with my mind. Now, in my mind, I could throw Roy Rogers out. I can go to a ball game and throw it out. I can go to a party and throw it out. I can have a good time and throw it out. But my mind latches on to stuff that has to do with Jesus. It's not easy to throw out, and so I stop and I think about it. I ought to throw it out. I ought not to have listened to it in the first place. So I'm careful what I put into the ear in third dimension there's stuff that does matter. What does matter? It's commingled truth. Commingled truth matters because commingled truth borders on a lie. It's mixed up. It's worse than a lie because it's mixed up. It's like Eve in the garden. Believing what Satan said was the worst thing because Satan had mixed her up by quoting God, by telling her it was a godly thing. She was mixed up. So it is with us. The thing I can do, and it won't bother me, are the things that people say, well, those are the things of the world. They don't bother me because they don't mix my mind up. But what mixes my mind up is anything that is commingled. I was thinking this to the limit the other day. And I thought in, in the beginning of my search to know Christ, I spent a lot of time in books, the, what we call deeper life books. I read Andrew Murray and Watchman Nee and Jesse Penn Lewis and T. Austin Sparks and Oswald Chambers, uh, great writers. In their day, they were the greatest. They knew God. And so I thought... I'll go back to one of these books. And in my library. I had uh, Andrew Murray's book called In Christ, and so I picked it up and looked at it. Now this is, that goes back to 1900 or so. And I looked at it, and I thought, this is what I cut my teeth on. I want to see what he says again. And you know when I got to the end of the chapter, what he said that I never would have noticed before? He said, now to make all this work, read your Bible every day. Go to church. Win souls. I had never caught that before. And then I realized how easily you could be tricked because none of that has to do with you being in Christ. It may have to do with you knowing it, but it has nothing to do with you being in Christ. And I thought how subtle even our old writers were because they didn't live in our day. They didn't know what we know today because God's truth has enlarged and grown in our generation. That's our responsibility to carry it. They didn't know it. But all that stuff goes in your ear and builds something up in your mind that you got to do this or do that to be who you're supposed to be. Now, Paul says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. You know what I do now? I learn to equate, evaluate, be distinctive, and rightly divide the truth of anything. If it has to do with my Lord, I'm very careful I don't commingle it and mix up my mind because my mind's already full of spooks that I'm trying to get rid of. I bless a little woman in California. There was a group standing around after a meeting and a fellow that was new to our group walked up to her and got to talking to her and finally brought out a book and he said, here, I'd like you to read this book. And you know what she said? She looked up at him and she said, no, sir, I won't do it. Oh, he said, it's a good book you'll enjoy. No, sir, I won't do it. She said, I'm getting my mind fixed on Christ now and I don't want it fixed on anything else. Ah. See, she had learned that you can't throw away commingled stuff without it bothering you. I've always got somebody that comes to me with a scripture that bothers them. See. 
You must never let a scripture you don't understand destroy the multitude of scripture we do understand. See? So what do you do? You lay it aside or you throw it out. What somebody said, you throw out because you're careful what you do to this mind. It's growing up in Christ. So our text says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In closing, I'm going to give you six verses of Scripture. These six verses of Scripture give us a characteristic for what is in the mind of Christ, of the Christ-life mind. Six characteristics of the Christ-life mind. The first is in Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. Romans 8 and 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now we're going to talk about life first. We'll get to peace last. To be spiritually minded is life. Where did he put the emphasis? Did he put the emphasis on what we do? Did he put the emphasis on us doing good works? No. He put the emphasis on a spiritual mind. You want life? It comes out of a spiritual mind. What is a spiritual mind? That's the mind of Christ, a spiritual mind. Second scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your minds should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. What a contrast he makes here between us knowing Christ and what happened to Eve in the garden. What he's saying is that the mind of Christ makes Jesus a simple thing. I dare say I have never brought the in Christ message to a good Christian who didn't know it who did not say, boy, that sure is complicated to me. It isn't complicated. What's complicated is your mind. It's full of pollution. It can't take a good, clean thought that Christ in me is my hope of glory and nothing else. That's the simplicity there is in Christ. Like the devil took a very simple thing in the garden and twisted it to Eve, so does he twist the simplicity of Christ in us. It's a simple thing. You were never made to operate without Christ in you. There is no Christian who can live without Christ in them. See, I could stay on those thoughts in forever. Philippians chapter 2, number 3. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Mind, it's a mind thing. Why have I decided that every one of our meetings ends with the little song, I see Jesus in you because I want us always in fellowship to see Jesus in each other. Not the bad that we do. Not even the good that we do. We are who we are by Christ in us and nothing else. That's what I want us to see. Not what you did that was bad last week. I've been in many a place where somebody did something bad and everybody shunned them in the church house. I want you to see Christ I want you to see Jesus in others. Lowly. Sure, that knocks me down a notch because I didn't do what that guy did, and still he's got Jesus in him and we respect him. I want to thank myself somebody. I'm above that. I didn't do that. We are who we are by Christ in us. That's why I see Jesus in you, and I see Jesus in me. Lowly. The mind is lowly. Number four. Titus 1 and 5. Titus 1 and 15, not 1 and 5, 1 and 15. 
unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. The mind of Christ is pure. Now, that's what we are growing into. We're not there yet. We still got a mind and conscience that's defiled. Why? Somebody operated in us that was contrary to us. He was mean, ugly, ungodly, and unclean, and so our mind and conscience is still defiled. But we're growing. We're coming into this kind of purity. The mind of Christ is pure. Keep on growing. Keep on. Number five is in Luke 24. Luke chapter 24 and verse 45. I took this scripture because this is Christ's last message after his resurrection, his last message to his disciples. And verse 45 says, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You know what I've come to see in the last few years? That even the smartest of people do not understand the Bible. And it bothered me. Why is it that intelligent people, and I dealt with people in my college days, PhDs, and in, in the Christ life, I deal with doctors and lawyers, why is it these people cannot understand? Why, why they tell me I read the Bible and just don't understand it. So I went after these new translations, and they helped me to understand a little bit. You know why that bothered me? That bothered me because even the old King James Bible is understandable if you can read. Ah, that's my point. Why do we want new translations? We didn't like what we was reading. We didn't like it. The evangelical church didn't like the in Christ message. It didn't like the scriptures that said God could perform miracles and heal today. So they tap-toed it down by, by putting all sorts of different words in there. They didn't want to read it. Somebody said to me, well, I like to get a Bible that's easily read. If you, if you can read fourth grade, third grade, you can read the King James. The problem is we don't understand sometimes what we read because we don't want to. Jesus was in his resurrection, and he says something here. He says that he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. You know, I read things in the Scripture. I've, I've always been baffled. But how it is I read these words different than somebody else? How is it I am so different than my brethren who read the same Bible? Why don't they come up with 146 times that Paul says we're in Christ and see a message in it? You know, I could almost count on my toes and fingers the people I've heard of in the world that even saw that. Isn't that ironical? They can't read, or they don't understand. How are you going to come to understand? A new translation? No, that's a verification. You couldn't read it. How are they going to understand? Holy Spirit has to open up our understanding to read the Scriptures. Truth comes by revelation. Point number six and final, back to Romans 8 and 6. It says, For the carnal mind is death, but the spiritual mind is peace. That struck me as an important thought because peace is what we're after in the world. Peace is what over 50% of Americans are depressed at one level or another. What is it they don't have? Peace. And you know what? Peace is unattainable. You cannot obtain, attain peace. 
it isn't findable. Because peace is a person. Christ said, I am your peace. Paul said, Christ is our peace. Well, I say it's unattainable by man. Because Jesus said, concerning wars, you'd have them to the end. We'll never have peace. The wars we're fighting now will not bring peace because we can't afford to stamp out the enemies. Have you ever noticed that? After World War II, we never stamped out another enemy. We did stamp out Hitler, and we stamped out Tojo. But we're so fixed now in this world that you can't stamp out an enemy. We couldn't stamp out the enemy in North Korea. One reason was capitalism. We owned and operated there, and it's been like that never war since. There'll be no peace. The war we're fighting in Kosovo right now is only one little stage of a big war that's been going on for 1,500 years. You'll not bring peace. We may get rid of an evil man, but we won't bring peace. Peace is unattainable by man. God had a perfect plan when he put Christ in us. That was to solve every one of these problems. Instead of us running around trying to find the answer, he put the answer in us. If we want to know him, he's there. If we want to live it properly, he's there to help us. If we want life, the life is in the sun. Thank you for listening today. You're about the best group I've seen this close to the Father's house. God love every one of you.